Welcome, and thank you for listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm your host, Joshua Jimenez. And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I've based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that with all my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map, and that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find some way to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church, and when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. Many people do not understand that there is a literal spiritual war all around them. And frankly, one of the biggest enemies we have in this spiritual war that is going on is not necessarily against the devil. And don't get me wrong. Don't don't get me wrong. He's fighting and he's fighting hard and ultimately he's our enemy. But there's something bigger that I believe you and I face. That would be ourselves. I firmly believe that my biggest enemy is the guy I shave in the mirror every morning. I mean, honestly, do you really think that Satan, who has all these different things going on, that we, that you and I are so important that he would trifle with us himself? Mm, here, here, I'll leave that decision up to you for yourself. But for me, I trip myself up enough. He, you know, he, all he has to think about is, well, his flesh will handle him. And he's right. So many times I get in the way of myself. I am my biggest enemy. And really, that sin is the integral part of what we're going to talk about today. Because one of the biggest things going on in this world, in a fight against God, and we have all these isms, right? We have, you know, creationism, and then we have evolution, you know, two different things fighting against each other. And and praise praise God that he settled it all in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God settled it all. But we have so many isms. And this one we're going to talk about today isn't a good one, but it's a bad one. And I want to talk about today, you saw the title. Today's episode is Humanism. What does it look like? Humanism. What does it look like? Humanism, I believe, is something that so many Christians are unaware of what true humanism is. They hit all around it, but they never hit it right square in the center. So let's talk about humanism. What does humanism look like? And we're going to discuss that today. Thank you for joining me here on the podcast. Of course, I'm your host, Joshua Menez, and I want to thank you for joining me here on Sandy Creek Stirrings. You say, where did the name come from? That's a very good question. In our welcome episode, episode number one, we talked about where the name Sandy Creek Stirrings comes from. And let me encourage you to go back and listen to episode number one, or you can go to our website. Lots of information there. But if you go to www, does anybody actually type that in anymore? I'll be honest with you. I never type in www anymore. But, you know, they say that on all the commercials. If you go to www. Um, but anyway, www. Did I say too many W's? I don't know, www.sandycreekstirrings.com. Again, that's sandycreekstirrings.com. Go to our About page, and you'll see a little paragraph, a couple paragraphs under there, and it says the name, and it'll tell you where we got the name Sandy Creek Stirrings from. You'll want to know. You'll want to know why is this podcast have such a weird name. And uh, so go to the website and find that out. Let me encourage you, while you're on the website, since you're there anyway, Click over on the contact page, and if you have a question about anything, 
<laughs> anything about the Bible, anything about serving in the ministry, things of that sort, let me encourage you to go ahead and fill out that contact form and send those in. I would love to hear from you. And so you can send in those questions there on the contact page or email me, joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Again, that's joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. So today I want to talk about what humanism looks like, and I think you need to understand and have a good grasp of what humanism is. I'm going to give you the textbook definition right out of the dictionary. Actually, I googled it, and uh, but here's the definition according to the dictionary. It is, and I'll give you the de- I'll give you the definition, and then I'll describe it, it, explain it. All right. So here's the definition. I quote: "An outlook or system of thought." attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasize common human needs, and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems, end quote. So that's what humanism is, according to the textbook. What, like, how does that look in actual life, though? So let's break that down. According to to the definition, humanism places the importance on man, not God. All right, so what's that look like in the real world? Humanism is when man says that he is a god. And you say, well, there aren't people like that. Absolutely there is, and we're going to talk about that today, what humanism looks like in everyday life. But humanism is when man says that he is a god. According to the definition, humanism says that man is inherently good. He's naturally a good person. In the real world, humanism is when man says that he knows better than God. You say, how's that? Because if man says that I am naturally good and God says you are naturally a sinner, you say, wait a second, God says I am naturally a sinner? Yes. Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of of God. And so God says you are naturally a sinner. You say, no, I'm actually naturally good. Well, then you are saying you know better than God. That is textbook humanism. All right, according to the definition, humanism says that man can figure out the questions of life without God because his reasoning is better than God's. God, I, my reasoning is better than yours. Humanism is when man says he does not need God because it is illogical. All right, and so there's several different viewpoints we'll we'll talk about today in regards to that. But humanism, in a basic sense, in a nutshell, that perfect trifecta. Humanism is when man says he is a god, he knows better than God, and he does not need God. That is textbook humanism. You say, why is it important that I know what humanism is? Humanism has been around for so long. Humanism has always been around since the very first sin. In fact, what did Satan tempt Eve with? Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What did he tempt her with? He tempted her with, You'll be a god! What's the first part of the trifecta of humanism? That's right, I. Man is a god. He tempted her with humanism. She could become a a god. And here's the deal. What we started off with this morning is my flesh. Myself is my biggest enemy. And really, the root of all sin is pride. What's best for me? What makes me feel the best? Me, 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 me. If you look how many times when Lucifer was kicked out of heaven, and so many times he said, I will, I will, I will. I will. He said, I will rise above the throne of God. I will be better than God. Really, where did humanism start? Well, it really started with Satan. started with Lucifer. Except back then it wasn't called humanism. It was called angelism, but and needless to say, that was a joke, y'all. And, uh, but needless to say, humanism has been around so long, and so many people will point and say, well, you know, their religion is okay, their things are okay, when really they're just nothing more than a prideful humanist religion. Humanism been around so long, but it experienced a worldwide uh, revival, you might say, during the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance was during the 12th century. It was a time of revival and learning. I mean, changes came along 
every front from social changes, political changes, economic changes, pretty much every area of life was changed because of the Renaissance. People began to try and get more knowledge and to and to learn more. And it, it, it really caused what the Renaissance what the Renaissance produced is it caused people to look at things and to reevaluate things, not take things for granted. And so they began to read more, began to think more. Now, some good things came out of the Renaissance. If you remember when we talked about the preparation for the Reformation during our Baptist History series, we said one of the good things that came out of the Renaissance was the fact that people began to look at the Roman Catholic Church, which, by the way, was literally a world power, was controlling the world at this point in time, the known world, that is. And people began to evaluate the Roman Catholic Church and say, are they right? Is what they're doing right. And people began to evaluate that. That was something good to come out of the Renaissance. But something bad that came out of the Renaissance was really a revival of humanism being brought back into full swing. And you know, Paul, the Renaissance happened 12th, 13th century. Paul predicted, Paul prophesied this would happen way back in the 1st century, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, where he said, For men shall be lovers of them own, their own selves. He said they'll have a form of godliness. They'll be high-minded. And then he said they'll ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And isn't that the truth today? We have so many professors who stand on college boards, and they're learning, and I've got this doctorate and this Ph.D. and this and that and this title and that title, and yet they still believe in evolution ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so Paul predicted the resurgence of humanism, which has always existed. He predicted that all the way back in the first century. Humanism is in full swing today. And here's what I will say. As you go through life, your biggest enemy is yourself. Where does it come from? From pride. The Why are you selfish? Because of pride. Why do you lust? Because of pride. Why do you do sins and, and steal things and try to make excuses? Why? It's all centered and it's all based in the root of pride, in the root of pride. And so when you look at your biggest enemy, it's pride, it's yourself, it's you, it's a human. But here's what happens when you go out and you begin to talk to people. I believe one of the biggest enemies to the truth that you will find on the streets within your neighborhood is not necessarily Catholicism, and is not necessarily Jehovah Witnesses, and not necessarily Mormons, though you will find some. But I believe all of these things can be centered down in one of the biggest enemies that you'll find a truth is humanism. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what is humanism today, and then in a couple episodes from now we're going to talk about how do you answer humanism. How do you answer humanism? Now here's the deal. You say, well, what do I need to answer? like, what, what, what does humanism actually look like? That's why we named the title, the title it is today. What does humanism look like? Because you're going to see it in your neighborhood. All right, now let me give you just a couple of religions that are humanistic at their center. All right, take a, let's take one that's kind of up and rising a little bit, been around for a while, but let's take Scientology. Scientology was founded in 1953 by a science fiction author, yeah, a religion based on science written by a science fiction author. Just interesting. His name was L. Ron Hubbard. You probably heard of him before. And it has really grown over the past few years because of some celebrities who have embraced the religion. But really, this Scientology is nothing more than a than a multifaceted money-making scheme. Hubbard became a multimillionaire after founding Scientology, but really all it is is a money-making scheme. You say, how can you say that? Because Hubbard said it himself. He said this of Scientology's financial policy. He said the financial policy of Scientology is, and I quote him, make money, make more money, make others produce so as to make money. That's what he said. Make money, make more money, make others produce so as to make more money. And you can find that within the book, The Scientology Story Part 2, The Selling of a Church. And um, those are his own words. Can I just remind you, we're not supposed to be greedy of filthy lucre. 
But here's, here's what it all comes down to. Scientology is based on the false belief that man is an immortal being. He's been around for billions of years. He's an immortal being from a different planet, and he's called a thetan. A thetan. T-H-E-T-A-N. Now, thetan, the word, comes from the Greek letter theta. Just interesting enough, if you were to pronounce it according to the Greek letter, it'd be thetan, which is Satan with a lisp. I just thought that was interesting. But you've got thetan. And the Thetan, all of us beings, are in a trap. We are in a trap of matter, energy, space, and matter. They call it um, matter, G- matter, energy, space, and time. I'm sorry. Matter, energy, space, and time. They're in this trap. They call it MEST. It's an acronym. And basically, what you have to do to get out of this trap and be the perfect Thetan you're supposed to be, and when you're the perfect Thetan you're supposed to be, you'll be able to control matter, energy, space, and time. How do you get out of the trap? Well, you have to go through a process called auditing. Auditing is a removal. And what are you trying to remove? You're trying to remove engrams, which are past hurts and pains. So basically, you have past hurts and pains. You haven't been audited. So you are trapped in matter, energy, space, and time. And therefore, you're not the perfect little thetan you're supposed to be. But one day, if you go through the process of auditing, it will remove the engrams and you will become perfect controlling matter, energy, space, and time. Now, isn't it interesting, by the way, the process of auditing costs thousands to hundreds and thousands of dollars. Every single aspect of Scientology has some sort of cost or fee associated to it. But isn't it interesting? Notice that what do they call man? Well, he's an immortal being that can control, if he's perfect, he can control matter, energy, space, and time. What would you, who would you think I was talking about if I said there is a being who has been around for billions and billions and billions and billions of years and he can control matter, energy, space, and time? Who would you think I was talking about? You'd think I was talking about God because by definition, that is God. And here's what Scientology really does is it bases everything around the fact that a man is a God. It's really what it's centered on. That's really what it's centered on. It's centered on the fact that every man is a god. That's its central core. You look at Buddhism. You go all the way back to uh, Siddhartha Gautama back in 600 B.C. in Nepal. Uh, Here's a guy who became a monk, decided he wanted to be enlightened and, and chase after nirvana, the highest peace and level of living. He believed in reincarnation and all these things. But really, what are they chasing? They're chasing nirvana, something they believe they can achieve in their own way. It's not heaven, but they believe they can have peace on their own. God said, you can't have peace without me. So what does a Buddhist say? They say, well, I can. I know better than God. You look at Hinduism. Hinduism uh, worships over 330 million deities. 330 million. They know all of them by name, I guarantee you. And uh, 330 million deities, but the whole basis of Hinduism is to, you know, to get to the their form of whatever you might want to call heaven or the afterlife, is to believe that God is in everything and is everything. The chair you're sitting on is a God. The air you breathe is a God. The tree is a God. The flower is a God. The sun is a God. And when you truly understand that, one day you will have your form of heaven, whatever Hinduism teaches. You get what I'm saying is the fact that Hinduism teaches that you are a god. So there you have three religions. Two of them say you are a god. Another one of them says I don't need god. What are they at their core? They're humanistic. They're humanism. The, oh, the, over, the, the prevailing theme The overshadowing theme of these three religions is humanism. They meet that perfect trifecta of humanism, which says man is a god, says I know better than God, and I don't need God. That's why they reject the God of the Bible, the only God, to manifest himself in human form. Tell his followers, I will die, but I have power to raise my life again after three days. He's the only God with an empty tomb. The only one. But why do they reject him? Because at their core, they are humanistic religions. Humanistic religions. Humanism is something you face every single 
day. You say, well, you know, I have an atheist, you know, co-worker. You know, atheism is a full-swing humanistic movement. It removes God. It says we don't need God. It says that we know better than God, which, by the way, allows us to get rid of him because we know better than him. Atheism goes back to the definition of humanism and states that, but, well, believing in God is not very logical. Remember, one of the definitions of humanism, in the, in the textbook definition, humanism was defined as that last thing, seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. According to Hugh, according to man who is finite in his wisdom, against God who is infinite in his wisdom. But the atheist says it's, it's not logical to believe in God. Atheism is a humanist movement. Yet, think about their logic, though, for a second. Atheism, typically atheists accept evolution as the as the reason for why we are here. There was this big bang where everything came from nothing, and then this particle of dust became an amoeba, and this amoeba began to grow gills, and finally we could breathe. So for a million years, we began to try and breathe more and more, and we'd run from the water to the shore and from the shore back to the water because we couldn't keep breathing because our lungs were still evolving. Sounds really logical to me. Here, I mean, here's the atheist who believes in the process of evolution, which bases on the fact that everything is evolving, which means everything is getting better. But here's what we truly have. We, what we have is, is God said 6,000 years ago when he had to kick man out of the garden, he said, hey, everything's going to now fall apart. Everything's going to decay. And look what's happening. It's all decaying, just like God said it would. It's all falling apart, just like he said he would. It seems to me like the atheist is the one who has his logic a little messed up. Just like God said in Psalm 14 and then in Psalm 53, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Atheism, Scientology, Hinduism, Buddhism are all humanist movements. In fact, agnosticism is a humanist movement. Agnosticism is a, a person who says that there may be a God, but he wants nothing to do in my life. He wants nothing to do with me. We can't know him. I find that interesting because God has always desired a relationship with man. I mean, that's why man was created in the image of God. God was the one who came down in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve and walked and talked with them. God was the one who sent his son to die for us so we could be redeemed and so we could cry, Abba, Father, be in the family of God. Agnosticism is nothing more than humanism because it states we know better than God. How's that? Because we say, you want nothing to do with us, and God says, I want everything to do with you. But it's a humanist movement. When you see someone who has a coexist bumper sticker on their car, Coexist is nothing more than a humanist movement. It says we know better than God. How's that? Because what coexist preaches, what coexist teaches, is that all roads lead to heaven, which doesn't even make sense. Because if you talk to a Buddhist who is a classic Buddhist, believes in classic Buddhism, started by Gautama, the Buddha, the enlightened one, they don't even believe in heaven. The Buddhist who believes in classic Buddhism will tell you, no, it doesn't, because I don't even believe in heaven. A Muslim, he believes that, yes, his God created a place for him, but he won't be in the presence of his God, which is by definition not heaven. In order for it to be heaven, you have to have the presence of God. And so, no, the fact is not all roads lead to heaven. Hindus will never get to heaven because of reincarnation. <laughs> it's a constant cycle over and over and over and over again. Scientology practically erases heaven. All roads can't and don't lead to heaven. And most people in religions will tell you they don't. But that's what Coexist teaches. Coexist says we know better than God. Why? Because John chapter 14, verse 6 says, I am the way. Jesus is speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus even said, God in flesh said, all roads do not lead to heaven. There is one way. There's only one. 
But what is coexist? It's a humanist movement. By the way, can I just say this? Coexist doesn't even work. Like the bumper sticker literally does not work in real life. If you look at the symbols on the coexist bumper sticker, you have uh, uh, um, Islam, you know, Muslims. Second one is the peace symbol, which is nothing more than pacifism. Then you've got gay rights, which is the third symbol. Fourth symbol is Judaism, Jews. Um, whatever the next one is, number five, pagan. It's, it's a little eye with a pagan star. Then you've got Taoism, the yin-yang. And then you've got the last one on the end is a cross for Christianity. And that's what coexist is made up of, is those symbols for those different worldviews. I'm not even going to call them all religions. Worldviews. Here's the reason they don't work. Islam, Muslims, excuse me, Muslims want to kill gay people, Jews, and Christians. And if they had their way, the pagans and the Taoists would either convert or die. I mean, give them a gun in a room with the rest of them, and the rest of them are dead. The pacifists, they support the annihilation of everybody else because they don't do anything about it. And then the gay rights people, they typically don't like religions because, typically, well, they don't like the Muslims because they're going to be killed by them. They don't like the Jews, and they don't like the Christians because for centuries and centuries, they have all, all these have opposed gay rights and sodomy. You know, sadly, now Christianity is starting to let them in. But for centuries, they have opposed. So typically, gay rights don't like religion. And then you got Jews. Jews don't like Muslims because they were born of the wrong son of Abraham. And they, they don't like Christians because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. And then pagans don't like Christians and don't like Muslims and don't like Jews because most of the times a pagan is someone who goes along the satanic worship lines, typically, not all the time, but most of the time, and then they want to indulge in sensual pre pleasures. That's one of the key things of paganism. Then you got Taoism, Dao which rejects um, Islam, rejects Jews, rejects Christianity, and says that everything unseen and seen has a balance, the yin-yang of the world. And then all of this, the entire sticker, is pointed to the Christian at the end, the cross. That's who it's pointed to, because the coexist person isn't going up to the Muslim and saying, coexist with everybody. It isn't going up to the pacifist and saying, coexist with everybody, because the pacifist is. He's like just there. It's pointed at the Christian, who has no threat to any of the rest of them. Coexist doesn't even work in a real in a real world situation. Take one from each group, put them all in a room together for three weeks. Somebody's gonna end up dead because the Muslim's gonna kill one of them. And then the rest of them will tell you, we don't get along. Not all roads lead to heaven. You can tell I'm getting a little fired up. I think the coexist bumper sticker is one of the dumbest things in the world. And uh, But anyway, coexist, what is it? It's nothing more than a humanist worldview. And so when you wake up in the morning, what do you have to deal with? You have to deal with humanism. You have to deal with pride in your own heart. Pride. But when you go out in the world so many times, you don't realize it and you don't have a name for it. But now you do today. You're dealing with people who are nothing more than humanists. They have that perfect trifecta. They say, basically, I am a god. I can do what I want, man. I'm in control of my life. I, I, I know better than God. Well, God wants nothing to do with me. I can sin. I, I'll go to hell and party with my friends. They say, I know better than God, and they say, I don't need God. God's never done nothing for me, so why should I follow him? The very breath you breathe is from God. Can I just tell you this? Humanism, that is the trifecta of what it looks like. So many times in your life you are dealing with humanism. Most of the questions you hear, most of the one-liners, the zingers before the door is slammed shut, most of the time it's from somebody who is at his core a humanist. The question is, how do you answer humanism? When you're out on the street, when you're talking to a coworker, when you're talking to a family member who at their core is nothing more than a humanist, how do you answer them? 
How do you answer somebody who basically believes they are a god? How do you answer a, a, an atheist who says, I don't believe there is a god? How do you answer that? So many times I think we're unprepared. We just did it like, uh, great. We don't know what to say. How do you answer a humanist? How do you answer an agnostic who says, you know, there may be a God, but he doesn't care about me? What do you do when a coexist person yells at you? You're so stuck up. What makes you think you're right and everyone else is wrong? And that's the question. What makes you think you're right and everyone else is wrong? What makes you think that what you practice and what you do is true Christianity. It's the only way to heaven and that you're serving the only true God. What makes you so sure? You say the Bible. That's what makes me so sure. Let me ask you this question. What do you say to the person who says, I don't believe the Bible? Because those are the questions humanism poses to you and I. And that is what humanism looks like. So how can you biblically, logically, eloquently, factually, convincingly, how can you explain why there is only one way and you know it? How can you explain that to a humanist? Well, that'll be the topic for our next humanist episode coming up just a few episodes from now. And so I wanted you to get a good idea of what humanism looks like, see how you're dealing with it in your own personal life, because I believe every single one of us listening know what humanism is now, and we can identify it with others. And now when we look around, you'll think to yourself, oh, yeah, that person's a humanist, and she's a humanist, and he's a humanist, and wow. The question is, now that you have it, now that you know it, now that you can see it, how do you answer it? That's the question. We'll answer that question a couple episodes from now. Until then, my friend, hey, thank you for listening today. Let me encourage you. Hop on that website, go to that contact page, send us in a question. We'd love to hear from you. But until next time, my friend, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ. <laughs>